Well, good morning, Sir James. Um, it's very nice to see you, and thank you for joining us on this uh, on this interview. Uh, could I? Uh, I am Roger Williams, and I'm the convener of the program committee for Haddo Arts. And I'd like to introduce you to Damien Bates, who is our, our convener of marketing at Haddo Arts. The first thing to say is thank you very much indeed for agreeing to this interview, but thank you even more for writing a, a marvellous piece for us to celebrate our 10th anniversary of Haddo Arts. Um, Haddo is spelt, by the way, H-A-D-D-O, and uh, you can find further details of Haddo Arts on the webpage, which is haddoarts.com. So James, just a word in, uh, in, in background detail. Some years ago, we had the Maxwell Quartet came to do a concert for us and we were so impressed, we wanted to invite them back. We are also conscious of the fact that Alistair Beetson is one of the outstanding young um, pianists on the professional circuit, often appearing at the Wigmore Hall. And we thought it would be a marvelous idea to join these two together to do the, the César Franck Piano Quintet. So with that in mind, that's how we came to invite you to come and write this piece for us. So thank you very much for this. And uh, we look forward very much to hearing more about this and also to hearing the work which will be performed at Haddo on the 14th of October. So the first thing I'd like to ask you is, concerns the title of the piece, James. You've given it a title, We Are Collective, which is, shall I venture to say, an unusual title for a piece of music. And perhaps you might like to tell us uh, the significance of that title and how you came to, came to think of it. Yes. Yes, well, I, I enjoyed writing this piece very, very much. And I, I remember when, uh, when I sent the score to you, Roger, that you came back to me and you, you said uh, more or less the same thing, that, that uh, it looked as yeah. if I enjoyed writing this piece. And I did, um, very much so. It's, uh, I mean, I do write a lot of very serious music, a lot of um, music that has a kind of theological uh, root and dimension. Uh, and this isn't like that at all. I do sometimes like to take a, a kind of uh, sideways um, direction in, in my work. And uh, I, I, must have, I must have been in a good mood when I wrote it because I can feel it and see it in, in the music. So basically, the, the piece, it's a one, one movement uh, piano quintet uh, lasting about 10 minutes or, or thereabouts. And it grew out of an, an initially from a sketch I had made, which was a kind of part song uh, using five vo uh, four voices on a piano. So, so originally, the material had, had text associated with it, but no, nothing came, came of this. It didn't come to fruition. And... Um, and the idea seemed to sort of dissolve a bit. But then I came back to it because I liked a lot of the musical ideas, simply the, the, the melodies and the rhythms and the, the concepts and so on. And I began to imagine how it might be um, uh, reworked in a way using purely instrumental sound. And I, I had to um, uh, take a very different kind of approach, of, of course, to the, 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 the four... Uh, string instruments in particular when there was no text involved and I wanted to make it, although it's still got a kind of singing quality that comes from its um, vocal roots, uh, it's it's now transformed into a, quite a virtuosic uh, piece for string quartet and piano. In fact, the piano part is probably the most virtuosic of the, of the five parts. So there are, uh, there's evidence that some of the original vocal material is still there, it survives, but in, in a new instrumental garb. The title was one of the lines of the original song, and um, the text was rather strange originally, um, little bits and pieces from all over the place that I concocted and put together. And it evokes a kind of, a kind of street chant, I suppose, um, or a kind of quasi-political slogan being chanted. You know, you know, you know the type, um, when, when people get together and shout in the street and so on. Um, I suppose that's quite a serious scenario, but but I've always found these scenarios quite comical in a strange way. I suppose I shouldn't really, uh, you know, that kind of shouting and rhythmic unison. Um, it, it, it can't help but have, have a kind of 
comic dimension. Uh, and I suppose that's that's been the main um, generator of the character of, of the music. Um, in fact, the, the original five notes of the chant of We Are Collective can be heard in the middle of this new quintet to the notes B flat, C, B flat, D flat, and E flat. Uh, I don't know, if, I don't have perfect pitch, but if, if this was a kind of B flat minor, it would be We Are Collective. Uh, so um, the, the audience might kind of catch on to uh, that rhythmic and um, melodic shape. And then it's uh, later, it's, it's, you hear various rhythmic and uh, transposed versions. So the title is perhaps a play on the idea of the togetherness involved in uh, ensemble playing, but as well as uh, there's a kind of scepticism, I suppose, about collective rather than individual and personal thought. And that's just a, a subjective thing on my part. Thank you very much indeed. Now, Damien, I think you would like to ask some questions. I, just following on from that, Sir James, I'm intrigued by the process of pulling the music out. I'm not, I'm not technical in any way. I, I used to be a journalist for my sins, so I always look at it in very simple terms. Does this come to you um, clearly, effectively, or does it, does it rattle around in your head for some time and need nurturing? And as a secondary question to that, do you, and forgive me again, this is a very basic question, but do you have to lock yourself away to the, uh, at the expense of everything else that's going on around you? Or can you look at it in, in phases so that you can work on it bit by bit? Well, uh, the, the compositional process is really quite different with every piece. Uh, and the material does live with me for sometimes a long, long while, sometimes years something can be germinating away in the background and then comes to the fore. Uh, and there are some pieces I do think about for a long while. And I suppose this is a case in point. Uh, uh, the idea was there probably even before Roger asked me a, a, about the piece. And I began to think uh, of redirecting some of that energy into the, the, the new sound world, which was the string quintet. And... Um, uh, as far as the, the working day is concerned, you know, I, I do have uh, I do have the, the day uh, to play with, as it were. Uh, it's, it's what I do. I, I've got um, a quiet place in the countryside now, uh, where where I, I work. And uh, although I do lots of other things, basically I try to clear as much space, both physical and mental, for me, uh, in, in order to settle to work. And I, I really need that silence. I need that uh, peace and quiet in order for the, the ideas to get going. Oh, fabulous. <clears throat> okay, James, back to the actual work. As you draw attention to a little motif which comes in the middle of the piece, is there anything which you would like to say to listeners coming to it for the first time which would help guide them through the structure of the piece at all? Yes. Um, well, the very first thing that happens is what I've described in my programme note as a, a kind of fanfare on the strings, a kind of declamatory statement in octaves and unisons and so on. And then it's followed quickly by a very energetic and boisterous passage for solo piano uh, marked in Italian, martellato e secco. That means in a hammering style and dry. And I indicated earlier that the piano part is very virtuosic, but it also has this character about it, um, right from the off, as it were, in that um, there's an aggressive boisterousness about the, the way that it needs to be played. Uh, perhaps that comes from the, uh, the, the title itself and, and the implications of the title. Um, and the piano seems to be, the other thing that makes it quite boisterous is that it seems to be playing in two different keys at the same time. Uh, so there's a kind of counterpoint all the, all the, all the while. And there are allusions to uh, old Scottish songs and so on and dance hall music songs and uh, uh, both, both in the piano part and in the, um, and in the string writing. So after this uh, boisterous passage, um, all five instruments come together in quite declamatory style at various points, but there is some quieter music a, a, along the way as well. And in particular, there's a passage which I've marked legato e, mis e misterioso uh, in Italian, uh, smoothly and mysteriously, 
uh, where that kind of boisterous um, character is dissolved into something else. And then there's another part marked in English, queasy, uh, which is self-explanatory. Uh, but the street, street marching feel returns before the music then heads off into what may feel like music hall fantasy territory. And the We Are Collective theme eventually asserts itself, along with wisps and allusions of half-forgotten old Scottish songs. And the music ends with passing jazzy and bluesy references. So that's a kind of uh, street map, as it were, to how the music develops. Thank you. I'm sure that we'll all find that very, very helpful as, as we approach it. Damien, would you like to ask uh, your your other questions now? Well, I, I think I'll abandon some of the others, but just reflect on what you were talking about there in terms of the Scottishness, and, and that's clearly quite important to you. Is Scotland a great place for creating works of art of this nature? Is, is it a creative place still, do you think? is it Does it have that energy about it that allows you to feed off it? Or, or is your isolation and focus on your own uh, piece uh, an important part as well? Well, I think both uh, are, are important to me. The, the isolation has become more and more important to me. Uh, but, you know, living and working in Scotland has always been a delight. Uh, it's always been, I've always felt a lot of support here uh, from my fellow musicians and uh, the various musical organisations uh, exist. Um, and, and many of them are committed to the living composer and Certainly as a younger composer, I've always felt encouraged by the likes of the Scottish Chamber Orchestra in particular, but also the BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra, the Royal Scottish National Orchestra, Scottish Opera, and, and the various chamber groups and choirs, of course, Capella Nova, um, um, have always been uh, great friends and, and colleagues. And um, the, the, it's a good place for, for composers to work. Uh, there's, there's a continuing interest in what we're about and what we might be able to add to the culture. Um, and over the years, you know, com composers in Scotland have allowed the Scottish dimension to enter into their work. And, you know, I've, I've mentioned the half forgotten old Scottish songs and so on. It's, it's done in a very deliberate way in this piece, but you know, one lives with Scottish traditional music, one grows up with it uh, in these parts and it gets under the skin in a creative way, sometimes so that the Scottish dimension becomes quite subliminal, especially with me, you know, I, I played a lot of Scottish and Irish uh, traditional music when I was younger. And um, sometimes it felt as if I was deliberately trying to allow that music into my, my own work, my um, compositional work. And I did it so, so many times and so, so often that it be almost became second nature. It's not the only characteristic in my music, but it is there. And it's, as I say, got under the skin of my, what I do and it's become subsumed into my musical character that it happens almost without me thinking about it anymore. Fabulous. James, can you tell us a little bit about um, writing for strings and for piano? Because they, they both produce their sounds in quite different ways. And I wondered if you had seen any tension between writing for these two sort of sound sources at all. Hmm. Yes, uh, I've always had, I've always been aware of the tension uh, in pitting string instruments against a piano. I've written a number of works, uh, a couple of cello sonatas, a violin sonata and some little pieces for violin and piano. And it's always the, the major thought in my mind, how do I make these two very different sound sources cohere and uh, form a, a unity? And it's in particular, particularly the case when you've got an ensemble of string mm -hmm. instruments working against the piano or with the piano, one has to take that into account. And sometimes uh, one has to make them oppositional so that they work in opposition and, and that kind of dialogue between two sonic opposites can be made to work in a compositional fashion. I mean, right at the beginning of the score, as, as I've said, it's the, the strings who start off, the piano does not play with them. And then when the strings finish their opening statement, the piano has its opening statement. It's almost as if the, the, the two groups as well, the two sound sources are presenting two different characters, two different subjects, perhaps. But eventually you've got to make them work together. You've got to make them 
come together. And composers have, got, have always had to be careful about that. Um, the piano is a very powerful instrument uh, and it can, can dominate and overpower um, um, instruments and, and, and voices that it, it works with. So the player has to be careful, but you can make it work. You can make the, the, the two sound sources come together. And I've always been interested in um, um, the potential for color, mixing colors. It's two different palettes, as it were, the, the piano sound and the piano piano sound and the, the string ensemble sound and they can be made to merge uh, in the way that you merge colours especially in the quieter sections and there are moments like that uh, throughout this piece. That's great James thank you. Could I just ask another question while um, it's fresh in my mind thinking about what you've just said I'm reminded of so much of your writing for voices, which of which you've done a lot, and I've been I've been fortunate enough to to conduct some of your pieces, and I'm just wondering if there's any link between the way you write for voices and the way you write for strings. Mm. Well, uh, I think musicians, instrumentalists, uh, are quite thankful when they can make their instruments sing. And um, there are many string players, especially cellists, for example, imagine that they are singing when they're mm -hmm. playing a, a, a given line. And I can understand that those analogies are powerful and important. And I've written a couple of pieces, and, and uh, I've just remembered a, a piece that I wrote for you, Roger, which mixes a choir with a string quartet. Um, yes. And, uh, I've done that in bigger ways, like, like with the Seven Last Words, which is a combination of two different groups, a choir and a string orchestra. And then later, much later, I did it again with my Stab at Matter, which again was mm -hmm. with choir and string orchestra. And again, it could be the coming together of opposites. But there's something about those two worlds which, in their own separate ways, are quite monochrome. They have a mm -hmm. single colour, the a single colour of, of voices together, and then another single colour of string instruments together. And making them come together again enhances the, the combined palette and um, um, in, in quite a, a limited way, but in, in, in potentially beautiful ways, the, the, the sound of voices and strings together um, can be rich, sonorous, uh, colourful, but it can also be quite dramatic too. And um, uh, I've certainly tried to explore all those uh, possibilities in the music I've written for Voices and Strings. Thank you very much. Damien? I, I have no, well, I have one really impertinent question, but Sir James, just to say thank you for your time and also thank you for your work. I'm very much looking forward to hearing it in October. Um, um, uh, as I say, I'm not a, an expert in this field at all. And my impertinent question, if I may, is when you're in composing mode, are you are you a delight to be with because you're full of joy and, and composition? Or can you be a nightmare to be around because you are so focused and can need tension to make it all work? Well, that's an interesting question. And maybe I'm not the person to <laughs> ask. Maybe ask the wife and children. Um, but I, I think actually when, when the work is going well, when the music is, is quite, um, uh, when it's flowing well, and uh, I, I am a joy to be with because I'm enjoying life. Uh, and and I, I think that that kind of communicates uh, when I come out of the study and um, enter into conversation and, and so on. Uh, it's when, there's, when the music isn't going well that there might be a problem um, because then, uh, I mean, I, I, love, I love composing and um, I don't like it being blocked in any way. And uh, it, does, it does affect, I think every artist, every composer is the same, uh, that they are, they're, 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 in, they're better company and in better mood when the work is flowing uh, smoothly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. James, I'd just like to come back to the actual work itself. From what you've said, it sounds as though after quite a period of gestation of this uh, original vocal work, as though, in fact, 
when you got round to writing the quintet, you wrote it quite quickly. And I was just wondering if um, generally you're a composer who works quickly or agonizes over a lot of detail and uh, get, you, you know the sort of composer I mean. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if there's any pattern to your work. Do you write quickly or do you tend to write slowly? I think I write quickly. Uh, yeah. There's something about the adrenaline uh, uh, getting going when you've got a deadline. And the deadline may be a long way away, but it does prey in yeah. one's mind, uh, sometimes years in advance. Um, because I always feel that, uh, although I do write a lot, uh, I always want to better myself. I always want to better the last work. Uh, so that I, the, there is pressure on me. I, I always want to rise above what has been done already and try different things. And that's why I, I really enjoy the uh, opportunity of moving sideways into a work which is a lighter uh, uh, and, and has a smile on its face, even a sardonic smile. Uh, um, it's different from um, the sacred music I write, for example, or the, um, uh, the, the, the very abstract works. I've written a number of symphonies I've mentioned the sonatas that, uh, that I've written, the two cello sonatas, a violin sonata, a piano sonata. The, these are quite abstract works. And you know, uh, we know that music can be a very abstract form uh, at its most fundamental level. Music communicates its power and its feeling and its emotion uh, just using its own stuff, which is great. It's, it's something that communicates beyond the, the visual and the verbal. And that's the power of music. Um, but we know it does lots of other things as well. It can pa paint pictures, it can tell stories, um, uh, it can collaborate with the, the written words um, in song and opera and so on. So um, all these things make the compositional process uh, a delight, but quite a diverse thing. You know, every piece is different for me. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, James.